So yeah, welcome everybody. Um, as you heard, I'm Matt Boydell. Um, been with Devon Wildlife Trust for quite a few years now. And um, funny enough, started with Devon Wildlife Trust about 12 months before we took on Wooda. So um, I've actually been um, with Devon Wildlife Trust for the whole of the time we've managed Wooda. And actually the project itself, although it's Wooda Farm Natural Solutions, actually it's slightly more than that. So um, hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, the obvious farmland area with the fields is Wooda. And then this is Scannycliff. So Scannycliff, um, we've had since 1984 and also forms part of the project. But in terms of the main delivery on the project, it is a smaller part. So I'm not really going to talk much about um, Scannycliff at all. And um, before I thought it'd be useful to put some things into context, it's probably useful to know a little bit about Wooda and Scannycliff and particularly Wooda, what we've done because without it, it's quite hard probably to understand the context of what we're talking about with the overall project. So Wooda Farm, 2006, um, very much a traditional Devon farm, small Devon farm, 55.6 hectares. Not particularly small, to be fair, for a Devon farm, but still at the smaller end. Um, grazed with sheep and cattle. And in purely agricultural terms, fantastic holding, wasn't, really, wasn't overgrazed. Um, you know, permanent pasture, a great site, and still reasonably, in general farming terms, reasonably species rich. But in a wildlife trust context for a nature reserve, um, the infrastructure was quite tired. It was grazed pretty much all year round, so it was always quite tightly grazed. So that's the sort of background to when we took the farm on, and just to show some of the development there, because water is an important farm and location for us as a nature reserve and a base, because it's where our, is one of our two main bases for the nature reserves team. So this is from 2006. Um, the legacy of the gentleman who left it to us um, hadn't farmed actively himself for a number of years. And um, this was soon after we took it on. So you can see it's still covered in um, ivy, quite run down. The old, um, one of the old barns and lean-tos, that's a paddock that stock would have gone into, but hadn't been used properly for years. But like I said, still those remnants that when we first looked about it, that got you really excited. So early purple orchids showing what is now a county wildlife site on one side of the site. Again, evident, really tightly grazed, but full of meadow ants. Um, and these are all photographs taken around the time. Bar now, um, just out the back of the buildings. And for anybody who knows Devon and um, the team valley and those Dartmoor Edge sort of woodlands, something that you'll be very familiar with, um, fallow deer. Now, fallow deer, fantastic. A, they, they rut on the property. Um, an amazing addition and stunning to see them moving through the farm. But as I'll come on to later in the talk, actually do pro provide a challenge from a management aspect on the farm. But there's a real characteristic of the Team Valley and the Dark Valley and those wood, um, those Dartmoor Edge Valleys. And Scannycliff, we took our, um, we took in 1984, a fairly typical Dartmoor Team Valley, ancient woodland, some history of some coppicing, uh, and predominantly managed with very limited intervention. We don't do a huge amount there. We have done a little bit of coppicing or generating a few sort of small openings and glades in the canopy, but generally it just does it itself. So this is a natural canopy glade that's um, opened up plenty of dead wood because we just leave it and don't tidy up. So the main thing we really have had to do over the last 20 odd, 30 years at Scanner Cliff is we did put in probably about 12 years ago, we extended the circular route that walks through it. So although a small woodland and quite challenging to walk around because it's quite steep, as typical of the Team Valley, there's a beautiful woodland because in spring, it is stunning. So though it's only a small woodland, it is quite popular. Parking's very limited. You can only get a couple of cars near it, but just those drifts of bluebells, anemones, um, you know, um, stitch work, a whole range, orchids coming through. It's absolutely stunning early in spring. But 
Well, the project itself, quite a minor part. We have done a little bit of thinning in there, um, but really its benefit is to be in a woodland now directly adjoined to water and making the whole thing bigger. So 15 years ago, when we took on Woody, you can see it's probably about six months after we um, the property transferred to us, the ivy has been taken off the building. Um, we've done some clearance work. And this bank here is where um, we, we went on to dig into the bank a bit to make the reserves workshops and stuff. And we've had a series of, we've had a series of sort of development work. So I should point out, so, the main building downstairs was developed into the main um, reserves office and upstairs was converted for accommodation for three full-time volunteers. So that was the first one of part of the first stage of work. So there's been about three, four stages to development works. So obviously anything like this is expensive. So as a charity, it takes you time to develop it all slowly. So where the main digger is, there used to be an old cattle barn that was taken down and repurposed for a, so a stunning meeting room that's really popular. Devon Rural Skills have used it. Other conservation organisations use it as a meeting place. Um, obviously, as we do, as we do, the Lynn Hay was all um, renovated. And this is the more recent one where the courtyard was um, laid out. So this was only sort of 18 months ago. That is where the digger was stood. This is a Lynn Hay, back of the office main reserves office and the volunteer accommodation up above. And in stage one, the reserves team moved up to Wooda um, fully. So they needed more modern facilities. What was there was quite drafty and um, wet. So we put in um, a new workshop, double workshop and two hay barns above it. So as you can see, um, more of a storage workshop where all the machinery is and then two double barns above. So that gave us a great, that's ongoing. There's still other development works that can be done. And, and the next part of the project, although not funded, uh, but connected to the project, but not funded by PPL, is to look at our energy on site. Um, so there's work being done and quotes being sought for sort of photovoltaic work so we can get off grid as much as possible and again, reduce our carbon footprints even further, which um, certainly links into the wider project brief. So over the last 15 years, the site has had a huge amount of investment in terms of land management directly. A massive amount of staff time, lots of money spent on contractors, huge support from our volunteers. We've had staff days. So um, this is Emily from the education team, two of our long-term volunteers who were out um, probably at the start of the day um, learning more about um, hedge laying. And that was part of the issue with the site. There was so little infrastructure. The hedges had got run through. The, the, the traditional Devon hedge banks had had cattle walking on them. So the hedges were very gappy. Lots of mature trees, which is fantastic and something we retain in, in our hedgerows, but no thick hedges at the base and no hardly any upright fencing that was suitable for managing the site. And to be honest, it's a great, it's a real treat for the reserves team to actually be doing work right on the site where they turn up to quite often. Um, you know, they have to travel out for 45 minutes to get to site. It's really enjoyable when you can turn up to what is your workplace, make a coffee and then go straight up the hill and your hedge lane 20 minutes after you arrive. Stunning place to work, amazing views down the team valley. Um, you know, a real pleasure and a privilege to be working there. So again, this is one of our volunteers and the contractor um, working on hedge laying. And some of the hedges were so run through, we rebanked them up in places and then they were so gappy. Um, we had volunteer parties and staff replanting up the, the original hedge lines just to fill them in a bit. The original, when we first took on the site, there's only two water points on the whole site. So cattle used to make a mess and wander constantly walking down, back down the hill to get to water. So we, from two springs, we developed a pond, put in a ram pump. So the ram pump pumps the water to the top of the hill where there's two storage containers and then it's gravity fed across the whole site from there. Um, 
quite a, well less expensive than taking mains water across the side but obviously the main benefit is we're off the mains water so all the water the cattle use is spring fed and um, fed through gravity across the side and historically there used to be an orchard which had pretty much all disappeared so I think this is about 2012, maybe 2010, but I think about 2012. So at this point, we still, the site was still grazed by cattle and sheep. And at that point, we had managed to change the grazing arrangement and it was still grazed all year round. So this is one of the reserves team um, planting um, orchard plant trees into the new orchard. And you can see, so there's no leaves on the trees. You can see it's in the winter and there's not a blade of grass to be seen. Now this field particularly was popular with the sheep. If you go forward probably eight years, seven years from that photograph, that's what it looks like sort of probably two years ago. And actually this sort of fits into the whole theme of that natural solutions and making in ways quite minor changes to a site. So obviously the orchard trees are getting away and they're having an impact on carbon. But the main thing is we pretty much exclude stock from this area now. We do let them in occasionally, not every year, and sometimes we just cut some by hand. Because we have visitors, we normally cut a footpath a metre wide, a bit of a loop brown, so because the grass gets wet. But that barn owl we saw earlier, um, you know, but common butter, what should be common butterfly species like meadow brown, that are grassland species, this is what they thrive on. So this long grass rather than a tight sward, it's stuffed with voles and perfect from a habitat point of view. And actually it's way, way better from a carbon storage point of view and um, just from a general environment point of view. So that's really where we got to um, over the last 15 years. And it's a fantastic site. It's been getting a lot better. So why, um, why, why the Natural Solutions Project now? Well, in a way, there's been a, it's been sort of serendipitous in a way that there's probably two or three strands that have come together at the same time. So DWT has, has made a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030. Now that's a huge challenge for any organization. And in particular, in my area, it throws up really interesting questions to do with reserves. Um, so, one sec. Uh, yeah, so it throws up really interesting questions to do with res the reserve management. That we did an assessment of how much carbon all of the livestock um, produced in 2020. And it was 423 tonnes of carbon from all of our reserves um, produced by livestock, which, as I was saying, seemed like quite, seemed like quite a significant amount. Um, it came into more significance when we realised that was 64% of the whole organisation's emissions. So that is, you know, um, not something we need to necessarily worry about, but it is certainly something we need to seriously consider and ideally significantly reduce but it's complicated because grazing also plays a massive role in how we manage our grassland reserves it's essential to maintain the mosaic of species richness of the grassland scrub woodland edge habitats so it's not as straightforward as just removing um, grazing because that would really impact on sort of one of our core functions of managing nature reserves. So that's it from a sort of climate change, sort of carbon and emissions aspect. But at the same time, um, the last couple of years, we've been in the stewardship agreements. We've had three different stewardship agreements, which are sort of government DEFRA schemes that pay for certain aspects of environmental work on site. And the third scheme was, due, was finishing at the end of 2021. So as always, it's that time to take stock in the last 18 months of the agreement to check whether it's doing what you want it to do, um, what improvements you could think you need to make to the site, um, where things could be better. And irrespective of this sort of climate change 
aspects of the work and you know needing really to seriously reduce emissions one of the obvious things was it was still overgrazed and from a biodiversity point of view we really did need to reduce um, the amount of stock on site so that was irrespective of any climate requirements we needed less grazing on site so we could get more structure within fields more diversity and sort of soften the edges um, and when you look there's great connectivity in Devon we're really lucky because of our hedgerows and copses but then when you look in field they're very flat as in there's no uh, upright structure at all and wooder although not quite as blank as that still has that feel that you're in on the whole fairly open grassland fields bounded by hedgerows and a more richer wildlife um, solution will be to have this high quality grassland with more scrub and trees through it sort of drifting through it so that's the basis of the project so the people's postco uh, lottery project and the natural solutions project really there's two major tranches to it so one is to develop a baseline of sort of species and data so any changes we make going forward we can review and carry on doing monitoring to check back to see whether the changes we're making are beneficial or whether they're having a detrimental effect and then in the longer term we can start to use some of this information to benefit and across our other wide across our wider land holding and other reserves and where appropriate people can take what bits of information is relevant to them to their situation on their own private land so what have we done so the first bit, the first tranche is a survey work, and that was split into two, really. So the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre, or DBRC, um, they led on the species survey work. So the first tranche of that was um, botanical. So the site's divided into 20 compartments. The grassland compartment had two by two quadrats in them, and the, woodland, um, or the woodlands were four by four metre quadrats. There was also sort of transect um, walks through the site uh, doing survey work. So that gave a, real de a really detailed picture of the species we had. And we had um, 210 species of flowering plants, eight mosses, eight ferns, and some really interesting ones. So um, greater broom rate, sort of quite a rarity for Devon. Uh, bastard balm, again, a rarity in Devon. And from all this information, DBRC are able to produce um, this map. So this is basically a um, habitat map sh showing sort of pictorially the range of habitats we've got uh, on this farm. And it's particularly useful because we would expect with the changes we're making over time for fundamentally the grasslands still be to be predominantly the habitat type, but for far more pockets of scrub to be able to be mapped out. And in five years time, if we, when we resurvey, each quadrat point will be revisited. So the quadrat and survey will be in the same point. So then you can not only produce a new map, but you can directly compare the species composition, just the number of species and their frequency in each of the quadrats. So that was part of the, the, the survey work that was done. So it's not moving forward, there we go. And then the next trance I did was butterfly transects moth trapping. So there was two butterfly transects across the site. Um, three volunteers regularly walk the route sort of weekly through the key season, perhaps dropping to once every 10 days or fortnightly later in the season. Um, there was larvae searches for grizzled, grizzled skipper. Um, for moth trapping, um, there's a, an A. Robinson MV trap was put out um, at least once a month from May through to September. And most of the species, certainly on the butterfly side, were on the whole commonish, but actually commonish in a, in a landscape that's really denuded of its um, butterflies. So small copper, ringlets, meadow brown. Now, meadow brown always strikes me in particular 
On the areas where we've had longer grass and more diversity at water for more years, the meadow grains are just in their hundreds. And as you walk through the grass, they just pop up everywhere. If you compare that to you know, a, a field that's grazed tightly, you'd be lucky to see one or two crossing the field. Um, it's that stark how quickly a grassland species of butterfly sort of numbers plummet when you take all the grass every year. In total, there were 17 species of butterfly, 150 species of moth recorded. Um, pitfall traps, data for this is still being collated. It's quite a slow process identifying um, individual species at this level, but just as a snapshot, um, there's 31 species of beetles, six species of grasshopper and cricket so far have been identified. Bat surveys, we already had good bat data for Scaniff cliff cops because um, the old manganese mines that were there um, have addicts coming out, sort of little cat, you know, little access points in. Um, so those have been surveyed and we've had greater and lesser horseshoes there recorded. But we have three points, A, B and C, where um, anabat recorders were put out between the 4th and 10th of um, August. They record constantly. Um, we have 15 species of bat recorded. Um, lesser horseshoes and greater horseshoes are still um, very much using the site. This is a photograph that's from the site, but it's more connected one I um, sourced through the Greatest Horseshoe Bat Project that um, Devon Wildlife Trust have. Um, just fascinating creatures to look at. Um, quite scary, they were large. And then additional to all the all that sort of detailed work we did, um, there have been was a day with Devon Fly Group where five members of Devon Fly Group came out and spent the day sweep netting. That was bolstered by DBRC doing a couple of afternoons sweep netting and another volunteer. Constantly recording inc incidental records while doing the botanical survey. It was a dormouse survey. It started late in the season, unfortunately. Um, a lot of this work has been done by volunteers. So a volunteer came and wanted to do the dormouse survey. We didn't, the tubes for the survey weren't out until September. We didn't find any on that check. But actually, that's very late in the season to start a survey. So the, um, those tubes will stay out and we'll do a full survey season next year. Um, one of our old trustees is, has been doing a um, hedgerow survey of all the hedgerows, fixed point photography for every field. So each year, or well, probably in five years time, we can take photographs from the exact same point. And that's particularly useful to show structural change in a field. So it's not really for species, it's to see how structurally it's different. A volunteer botanist has offered to do a dandelion survey next year. Um, and one of the things we didn't do this year, we didn't um, have a volunteer to come and do it, was a bird survey. Obviously, it's one of our reserves. We do have good bird data, but it'd be nice to do a proper bird survey next year to tie in with this baseline data. And then the University of Exeter did um, two tran main tranches to their work. So the first element of the work was a soil survey to gain sort of a baseline characteri characterization of the soil profiles, properties across um, the holding. Um, so 30 samples were collected from 23 from the grassland and seven were taken from the woodland and the orchard. Um, and these are shown by the points on the map. And those points as close as, as often as possible and as close as possible are tied into where uh, the botanical quadrats were also being done, just so the data links together really well. And the data they gave it gave is incredibly detailed. Um, I won't go into it in any detail, but basically they took core sediments to 15 centimeters, um, so you can do a full carbon stock assessment. And then there's a really comprehensive sort of analysis of a suite of different. Um, elements that they look for, um, particle sizes, how the soil's made up. And we've got really detailed information that in the future, we can replicate that soil survey to compare what's changing. So that really isn't about so much what's there exactly the detail now, it's how it changes in the future. And not too surprisingly, um, the soils are in quite good condition. It's been under permanent pasture for years and years. So you would expect under permanent pasture that hasn't been ploughed regularly and reseeded that it would 
be in good condition. So, but that doesn't mean there are areas that aren't in as good condition and long term by not taking all the grass off um, as it breaks down, that does increase the depth of your soil slowly. So, you know, there's still, there's still a really crucial part, although we weren't expecting in this case to be massively depleted. And then the second half of the survey work that the University of Exeter did was um, so, um, incredibly detailed, oops, let me jump through, aerial drone survey work. So these aren't your average drone that you, would, that you could buy. So the, this, um, these are used to create a baseline survey again, which allows the quantification of vegetation and structural change in the future to be assessed. So each pixel is down to a definition of five centimeters, uh, which is quite incredible. And what it means is when they, they do, they took thousands of photographs, literally thousands, that then uh, stitched together and they overlap by about 70%. And what it gives you is a map of the holding like this. Now, this is actually a static map. It's just a screenshot because normally what you would do is it generates it and then you can pick a point, any point on the map and zoom all the way in to the point at which you can see, you know, very small shrubs growing out of the you know, um, new sort of gorse or blackthorn, very tiny ones starting to grow. So it allows you to really look at the changes in the composition of the vegetation in the future. So that, get, that gives us a baseline going forward and gives us, um, also, a refresh as to what we've got currently, because it has increased the number of species. So I think in total, the species count from the species work is at about 540 um, identified species from last summer. The second half, main half of the work that we've done this year is practical work, sort of on the ground, habitat work and infrastructure work. So the first part of that would be some of the fields are really quite diverse and there's others that although unimproved in nature um, and perhaps quite open and have lots of fine gra grasses, they don't have a very diverse sort of flowering range. So the number of flowering species and sort of typical plants um, you'd see are considerably lower. So what we do is we use a, a contractor to do it. We have a sea brush harvester, which just basically literally does as it sounds, it has a um, it spins and brushes the seed off the flowers, catches them in the bin. So we do that over areas where we've got most diversity and then those seeds are dried over the summer. And then in autumn time, we break up the soil a little bit, as you can see here. And then um, the contractor then came back in and he did all of this work and spread the seed. Now actually, because the seeds collected in the way it is, there's still little bits of chaff and the seed side is very variable, so actually it's easier to sow it by hand, which is why he does it, which is why you can see him sort of knelt in the back of the wagon, throwing it out, broadcasting it by hand. So that was one element which over the next few years will help give a far more diverse sort of grassland mix that's got far greater range of flowers and far more diversity. And then going back to right at the start, so the other challenge or issue um, fantastic as they are, um, a key component to the natural biodiversity and ecosystem and all that of the site, the deer do pose an issue um, because they're in really high numbers uh, in the team valley. So on this 56 hectare site, we probably have um, on average 30 to 40 fallow deer that are semi-resident on the site. And this is the sort of effect they have. So there's no cattle access to this area. This is purely from the deer trotting in and out. Now that's fine, but what, they, what it does mean is they nibble um, their browsers. So they do eat grass, but they also eat young growth, young saplings, and they have a real impact on the sort of structural layer in the woodland, sort of the ground layer. Um, and actually they're having an impact on how we can regenerate the site. So this is the top of Scannycliffe Wood. And years ago, when we took the site on, the fence line, such as it was, used to be tucked in right under the tree line, which is why you've got this stark woodland edge grassland. 
So in 2010, we moved the fence line right out. So this bit gets cut for hay and then gets grazed. This bit has no management on it at all. And at this time of year, early summer, July time, um, before the hay cut, so perhaps late July, you can see they look very similar. But no evidence of trees growing or scrubs spreading out. This is from this win uh, from winter 2020 um, last year, so 2020, 2021. And so again, Scanner Cliff, it's from the other end of this fence line. So this is Scanner Cliff. This area was cut, hay, um, baled, and then grazed. This area has had no stock on it for 11 years. Now you can see this, the, this, the blackthorn and the shrub layer is desperately trying to get growing, but there's so many deer, they just browse it constantly. So they're like miniature, they're like miniature little dwarf shrubs or bonsai trees. They've been at this height for the last seven, eight years. Um, and they're dotted all the way along. Now what we want is those to sort of get up and get growing and to get more diversity through here. But with the deer pressure as it stands, that's just not really happening. So one of the things the project's done is put some deer exclosures in. So this is a contractor erecting sort of more traditional deer fencing, six foot high wooden stakes with um, wire netting, which is obviously just designed to keep the deer out. Of, of, um, that's the compartment. So this side, the deer still have access to. This side tucked up to the hedge, they don't. And we're also trialing for us a different technique. Um, I, pre I prefer this in the sense that it's far less intrusive on the on the site, so and, for, and on the landscape. And actually, it's quite it's quicker to put up. So there's only the odd wood, permanent wooden post put in, and then these are just fairly routine um, electric fencing, plastic electric fencing stakes with a metal spike on, but they're a little bit higher than um, normal. So they go sort of high waistband height. And they're on a solar panel and battery. And so again, um, we know they've been used in a woodland setting and they've been very successful. So we're trialing those. The beauty of these ones is they're really, if it starts and we start to get scrub getting away, we don't need to exclude deer once the scrub gets away. And then we can move these far quicker and easier than we can move the more permanent wire option. Within some of those deer exclosures where we've tree planted. So this is our amazing uh, midweek group, the um, South Devon and Dartmoor midweek group. And they come out every Wednesday, do a huge amount of work for across all of our sites. So they're planting up one of the exclosures and um, deer exclosures with trees. We've also planted up some corners of fields and then just moved the fence line in. So the deer would still have access to those areas, but it just stops the cattle going in because um, um, cattle are so heavy, uh, they, nothing they seem to like better than just um, whacking, walking straight through any planted trees. Um, again, so more tree planting going on. But I should say also some of the exclosures we've put in, we've left completely empty, um, partly to see how quickly natural regeneration occurs. And we will get a slightly different, so this is planting at woodland really. So these ones that are planted will develop into woodland and slowly they'll develop an understory. The ones that have, haven't been planted will go through a scrub stage, obviously. So you're more likely to get blackthorn and gorse and more scrub type plants coming in rather than um, a more broad leaf tree. At the start of the talk, I mentioned we put in a water supply and actually that's worked fantastically well, but it was for 15 years ago it went in. And actually this is the original pond that was put in and it had scrubbed up really heavily. Now there's two things with that. One from a biodiversity point of view, having half or a third, half of the, of the pond with trees along it shading it is fantastic. But to have it all surrounded, firstly means there's a huge amount of leaf litter dropping into the pond, which silts it up quickly and means the time at which we need to dredge it out gets quicker. But actually this is coppice. So all these screw, all this um, willow will grow back and we'll end up with young willow growth and really diverse wildflowers through this area, which from a nectar source for birds as the scrub develops is really crucial. And it also cleans our main water supply. 
Further down, we put in a new sediment catchment um, trap. So this just means any sediment that does come down, it drops in there before we pump the water back up to the main um, storage point on the top. And our last field with no water in, um, while we had the opportunity, we put an extra trough up. And then lower down on the site, it's amazing. Um, this is edge of Dartmoor. For those of you who don't live that close to Dartmoor, um, Dartmoor is a pretty wet place. It gets quite high rainfall. And actually, water as a, as a habitat type is actually fairly dry because it's steep slopes. So it pitches off really quickly. So the main pond, uh, the main, so this is, again, a series of smaller ponds um, further down from the main one. And you can see how much they closed in. So we're just opening them up a little bit. And this is purely to do from a biodiversity point of view. Um, we don't use these ponds for stock for water. They are just for biodiversity, but you can see how closed in they got. Um, we still leave trees around them. Um, so, you know, another great gain from a biodiversity point through the project. And the last bit, which I haven't got any photographs of at the moment, is we've also been doing a bit of very small limited thinning at Scanny Cliff, um, the woodland, which is really just about manipulating some light levels. And obviously, because it's coppicing, actually you're just changing and um, getting a more uneven age distribution in the wood, because it's all fairly similar age on the whole. Um, so that's most of the practical work covered. And then another key theme for the project is one, working with volunteers. Um, we have a huge number of volunteers across Devon Wildlife Trust. We really couldn't deliver our um, reserves work without all their support. They do a huge amount across all of our reserves. And with this project, a lot of it is about things like this. So talking to people, um, trying to get people involved. So this is a family event um, that was put on that were, so um, Paul and Emily closest to the camera, two of our education team, and Andrew furthest away, one of the reserves assistants. Um, we had young family groups book in through the day because um, of COVID, they come to arrive all at once just to make things challenging. So um, small numbers of people are booking slots through the day and they came in and got involved with tree planting on the site, which is always fantastic having, getting, sort of young people engaged and um, the opportunity to come somewhere and just have the fun of planting the tree, to be honest, it's a great place to be. So that captures really what the work is and what we've been doing um, to date in terms of direct delivery, but we have actually done some other bits as well. So what changes have we made and what further changes are we planning on making? So in 2020, there was um, 44 cattle grazing wood. Uh, probably 10 years earlier, it was probably 30 cattle and 80 sheep. So the numbers have come down from where they used to be, which is why it's relaxed. Uh, when we talk about it, we talk about giving it a chance to breathe. So it just takes the pressure off. Everything feels as though it relaxes and you start getting a response in wildlife. So having looked at what the stocking levels were, 20, summer of 2021, we reduced the cattle numbers to 35. Um, and we would have done it probably, possibly it's a little bit more, but it was the final year of the HLS agreement 2021, which I'd mentioned earlier. So we sort of had to maintain things until the end of the year to a certain degree. So that was at Wooda. At the same time, we're obviously considering, and um, that was partly, we would have done that pure anyway, just on biodiversity grounds. In a similar vein, um, Exeter Valley Parks, which we took on three years ago, we reduced the cattle on two of the sites there. So the cattle numbers on two of Exeter Valley Park sites. And just from purely on biodiversity grounds again, and just from reducing stock on those three sites, we reduced the emissions from 423 to 409 tonnes, which actually 3% reduction, it's not an earth shattering amount, but actually we only really finessed the stock numbers. We haven't made significant changes. I mean, 35 is still 
too many undoubtedly when we look for going forward and looking at it in the future. The question is how low can we go and what are we taking into account? So just very quickly, just so you can understand it, the wildlife benefit in reducing the grazing, this is photographs probably from about 2010 when the grazier at the time still had ponies, cattle and sheep on site. And you can see um, there's not a lot of grass left on the site, just a bit of um, horse dung. This is from 2006, seven ish. Um, you can see we've only still just taken on the farmhouse. Um, the building work hasn't been done. And this is what is now those amazing shots of the orchard. And again, you can see just how little grass there is. This was taken up on the top of the hill this summer. So this is having reduced the stock numbers to like 34, 35. And the stock had grazed through this field. So they come in, they pick their way through it, but they move on to another bit. We don't allow them to take it all the way down. And you can see the immediate difference and the immediate benefit from reducing those stocking levels. And this takes it to the next step on. So this is an area that's predominantly have very much reduced grazing for a few years. Um, we occasionally cut a bit by hand and we occasionally let the stock in there. And you can see just the difference it's made, how much scrub's coming up. Now, the, partly the reason we can do this here is it's, 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 a, it's, the, one of the, it's quite a distance away from Scanniclid. So the deer get more disturbed, interestingly. So we think they probably come less on the front slopes. So that's what happens sort of visually. So, and this is what I mean by that structural change. That there is very different to that field. You know, the connectivity, so there's hedge round, hedges bound this field, the connectivity across this field and all those little micro habitats and, you know, there's young gorse that birds nest in, um, lots of long grass for insects to overwinter in, um, nectar sources. It's a very different proposition to this. So reducing grazing, it's still a balance though. So there are, there's obvious the benefits I said for improving soils, increasing carbon storage above ground by allowing scrub to develop, increasing structural diversity and all the benefits that brings. Basically, it's, it's making more space for nature. But there is a balance, and it's a very serious balance that we have to get right, because there is a risk by reducing grazing too far, because we could end up with a loss in species diversity. The, the UK, and particularly that sort of more lowland, moving into upland setting, the species rich grasslands we've got there are based upon grazing. And if we completely remove grazing, it will slowly go to scrub and the whole area will go to scrub and the next stage is in succession is for it to go to woodland and we would lose a huge number of the associate of grassland and all the species richness associated with it so that increase in trees and scrub is really important on our sites and across our species rich grassland but we could never just let them run riot and transfer them and plant trees everywhere. The place to do that is on heavily degraded ground and heavily degraded landscapes where we don't have already this structural and species diversity. So plan for 2022, reduce the cattle numbers to below 25, um, carry on the species monitoring, particularly looking at how the deer exclosures are are changing and particularly checking that the electric ones are fully working and the last decision we've not quite decided on is whether to carry on taking the hay crop from the top fields. I think we probably will next year, I've got to be honest I haven't quite done the figures to work out the difference in emissions and balance between some stock wandering through and a tractor taking a hay crop. But I think for next year we've over sown those with species with um, really species rich seed, diverse seed mix. So I think next year we, we will take a hay crop again, a very late one, because that probably is the best way to maintain the open nature of that. So those are probably the key things for next year. So at its core, the project, it's, it's really challenging when a lot of your land is already 
really species rich. DWT by nature, we have nature reserves that generally speaking are species rich. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, they are low in terms of emissions. And the number of stock we have are low in emissions, but there still are emissions. And sort of morally and as an organization, we do need to take a lead. So we do need to seriously assess where we can reduce those grazing levels um, to get them as low as we possibly can while still maintaining, increasing and maximizing the species diversity. So at its core, really, what we're currently doing is assessing and monitoring how grazing levels can be reduced, both cattle and deer, whilst increasing and maintaining the species diversity, maximizing the carbon and reducing overall emissions. So hopefully that gives you an introduction to what is, I should emphasize, year one of what is a long-term project. Um, if any of you came hoping I was gonna give you some really key answers um, to this really complex question, unfortunately, I'm sure you're slightly disappointed because it's a really complex um, picture that we're trying to work our way through, as is everybody. So thank you for taking the time to uh, take some time out of your evening and listen, and um, I'll draw to a close there. So your computer's ready to go upstairs. Fantastic. So we're just gonna swap over. <laughs> so if that talk wasn't dynamic enough for you, we're just gonna switch over just to uh, shake things up. Now I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see my face again. and. Uh, Please uh, continue to send your questions in if you do have them. We'll try to get through as many as possible. I do appreciate that we've run slightly over time. We'll try and answer a couple of questions um, during the talk and then maybe a few questions can be answered either potentially on our website or in an email after this event. Uh, so uh, whilst I'm, what I've realized is uh, Matt was talking about deer and uh, the challenges and the um, benefits of having deer on your land and I've got a wonderful deer behind me so uh, there we go uh, irony or potentially uh, good planning who knows so uh, if, I, if we get through a few questions Matt I uh, appreciate we've yeah, run yeah. slightly over time so we'll try and make this as quickly as yeah. possible it's the first talk I've ever given where I keep running up and down the stairs I've got to be honest <laughs> It's a, it's a talk of lots of exercise. Okay, so, uh, excellent. Right, so if I gather the questions up. Oh, we've got a lot of them. There's no surprise there. Uh, so the first question, which may have already been answered, Matt, is uh, how much of the land is still used for grazing? Probably percentage-wise. Uh, yeah, so out of wood, that's sort of 56 hectares. I would guess we're probably... I haven't, I've got to be honest, I haven't added up the exact figure. So I would guess we've excluded probably about four, three hectares in terms of completely excluded through deer. Um, we also have some land that was already not really grazed, sort of around the um, uh, orchard and stuff. So I would guess out of the 56, 57 hectares, currently 46 is grazed. Fantastic. Uh, so the next question is, uh, this kind of project cannot be applied to other farmland without a lot of people and money put into it. Could something like the World War II land army, uh, land army I assume it means, uh, be developed to supply labour and advice to farms to help them become more resilient and climate, uh, climate and nature focused? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is interesting. So I suppose... On a nature reserve, if you think of a scale, nature reserves would be at one end, and if you were thinking really intensive farming, that would be at the other. And how you pick on that scale where you, you're going to operate is challenging. I suppose what work what day to day on the nature reserves, what I don't have to take into account is generating an income through agricultural production where we do generate some income. So our graziers, we don't have our own cattle, graziers come on our site and we charge them a, a annual grazing license, but it's very low because we don't allow them to put much, many stock on. So it's not a driving point for us. So that balance 
in a wider set and is challenging because I appreciate what you're saying in terms of there are capital funding. So the through agri-environment agri schemes, so currently HLS, but the new environmental land management scheme, there are options to pay for capital works and they will pay for upgrading capital works. The tricky bit is um, what we're doing isn't directly applicable, sort of directly applicable to mainstream sort of, you know, sort of really productive farming, because that isn't what we're doing. Um, and there's room for both. We need, I would argue, we need far more space in our countryside, in Devon and across the UK, where nature takes a priority. We still do need those areas that are consistently producing food. A lot of them could do it with better resource protection and, you know, without soils disappear, all the things we hear about soils disappearing into rivers. There are some great farmers. I, I used to work for the National Trust, for instance. My old tenant farmers in East Devon were fantastic. They looked after their ground amazingly well. So this isn't meant as a criticism of farming in general. It's just the direction it's taken. So, yes, a land army to help in certain circumstances, you know, that idea of getting labour done and being able to help farmers deliver the bits that are non-productive. Yes, I suppose that, you know, they, they will perhaps be more likely to do some of that work. But going forward, most of what we're doing is really just reducing the grazing levels. So because we're a wildlife trust and we're trying to demonstrate what it's doing, we will we do put all that extra effort into recording species and monitoring so we can demonstrate what we're doing. But you can't get away from fundamentally, now we've got the deer exclosures in, and now what we're really talking about going forward is slowly reducing grazing levels so we find ideally that optimum point where we have a lot more scrub and a lot more structural diversity on the farm while still maintaining the sort of that really species rich grassland sward. So yeah, so that, I'm not sure that answered your question at all. So sort of, yes, it's always helpful, but probably isn't the stumbling block for a lot of farmers, to be honest. That's a very good point. And I think one thing to add to that is that, although obviously Wooder Farm is a classic case of trying to enhance nature um, and reduce our carbon footprint um, in kind of natural solution ways, we also try and um, work with farmers and landowners to utilise what resources they have available, um, particularly with our land advisor and land advisors and different projects. So um, although sometimes the work that we do on wood might not be applicable to all land, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, advise on land that's larger or used for a different no. purpose. No, um, those, so I was going to say, and those advisors pick on that scale again. It's very, yeah. you know, but when they're out advising people, it's very much per specific advice to the specific location they're in and what the people want to do because it's always a joint conversation where you're you're both going on that sort of journey of making some cases small changes in some cases really big changes exactly and uh, so we've got quite a few questions around the same sort of line around deer culling so is uh, deer culling considered um, or is it is the deer uh, exposures or are there deer exclosures uh, a kind of method of avoiding deer culling? Um, so yes, I guess in a way it, it is a method of avoiding, well, it's a method of avoiding deer culling, but also an acknowledgement that the deer population in the Team Valley um, would take systematic, some systematic culling through the whole valley for it to be reduced to a point where the deer weren't impacting scrub regeneration at Wooder. Um, deer culling as a wider topic is, is interesting. Um, you know, there's no getting away from it. Um, if, you, if you excluded deer from most of the Team Valley woodlands, they would look substantially different. So um, a colleague of ours was on the Isle of Wight recently where they have no deer and the woodlands there, a lot of them you can hardly see through because there's such a dense scrub layer at ground level. If you walk through most of the woodlands at Dunsford, one of our nature reserves, you can see 200 metres through the woodland. It's completely barren at ground level. That is an influence of deer. Now, you know, that, that wider discussion um, 
technically on DWT land, we do allow, we do technically allow culling if it was purely on conservation basis. We don't really do it. Um, what we don't support is any um, culling from a sport point of view. But it's not something we're currently actively doing. It's it's a challenge though. Um, I think is the shortest answer. Um, and it does get into there's a whole range of different views on culling that you know across the across the wildlife trusts generally and across within wildlife trusts, you know, I'm sure there's different views within DWT as to whether culling is something from a conservation point of view that's acceptable. Thank you. And the next question is you've mentioned above ground carbon. Have you have you seen increases in soil carbon? Um, so, yeah, so that's partly what the Ex University of Exeter's work was based on. And the general, um, so at the moment, no, what we've done, we wouldn't have done. And the general sort of background to it would be where soils have been undisturbed and under permanent pasture for many years, the soil, con the, the carbon content, generally speaking, will be high. If you were to, um, plow that field every three years and put in like a lay um, and keep renewing the crop, um, even when it's grassland or, you know, um, sort of legumes or, or clovers, that would decrease the carbon content just through the disturb, regular disturbance. So we knew before we started the project that wooder doesn't have a significant history of disturbance for years and years. So it didn't come as a massive surprise to know that the Generally across the grassland, the carbon content is pretty good. Now it can't, but there's areas where it's not as good, so those will increase. And as I was trying to explain, so if you don't take all the grass off, when it flattens at the end of the winter, um, it gets taken in by soil fauna, worms and stuff will take it into the soil, and that's how your soils increase. So that's a very, very slow process, but in the long term, your soils do get deeper. Conversely, if you keep doing arable crops and they get dry, your soils get shallower. So I, I wouldn't expect there will be really big increases in the short term, but there will be slow, uh, there will be slow increases. And what we are doing doesn't decrease the carbon, which is equally as important in a farming setting, because so many farming operations do release carbon. Fantastic, very detailed answers, thank you. Um, and probably the final question of the evening, just because I've realised that we're um, quite a lot over time. Um, a lot of the answers to your questions can probably be answered in some form on our website, um, and we'll try and potentially answer some of the questions in an email after this talk. Um, last question of the evening is, have you experimented with different grazing regimes? What are the cattle used for beside grazing dairy, dairy or is it meat production? And beside hay, are there any economic aspects? Um, so the cattle are beef, um, so they're uh, so part of beef production. Um, they're generally, um, they're, they're, uh, just as of interest, they've generally been Hereford, Hereford crosses recently, quite young stock. Um, it's a localish farmer um, a few miles away. Um, so he brings his stock onto site. Uh, they come on May, April into May and leave September. Um, we might reduce that a little bit, the, how soon you can bring them on in the future. So yes, um, to be honest, the, fundamentally they, they are part of uh, meat production. And what was the rest of the question? Uh, oh, uh, do we, do we generate, so income wise, at the moment, no. So um, as part of the agreement, we sort of set rents, the annual grazing license, um, we have an idea how much it's worth if the farmer of the guy who brings the cattle does nothing. Actually, he does get involved with some other pieces of work through the year. Um, so he's helped with some fencing in the past and gates and stuff. So we tend to discuss the, uh, we, we've reduced the, the annual cost some years um, and he takes the hay crop. So the, the, the grazier who brings the cattle um, also arranges the hay cut and takes the hay. So that's part of taking into the cost of his grazing license. So really, we, although it's a grazing license, we give him um, that sort of control of the land for that six month period where the grass is his to do what he wishes with. 
as long as it's what we've asked him to do. So he can't not pet, put the hay. We've asked him to do a hay cut, um, and he can't put cattle where we've not asked him to. But within those remits, he just pays us a rate for the land. Excellent. I think, uh, although I said it was the last question, I think this has uh, been raised a few times and it would be right. quite useful. Yeah. Last question to the talk is, do you see this project providing a model for other producing farms? Um, well, uh, if you whole for if you were trying to earn, so if you were a farmer with 100 hectares and that 100 hectares supports your family, unless the new environmental land management scheme has grants in it to support very low level grazing then across a whole farm if it's his sole income then probably not but actually that's not really how most farmers work so this model and what we're learning could work on areas of farms so perhaps they're less productive land anyway um, some of the larger farms are contracting a bit and not farming their less productive land anyway at the moment and there's a lot of changes in farming age demographic is getting older not all farms are carrying on the same way the funding landscape so through the environmental land management schemes is in the process of changing so that again will have a knock-on effect so you know 100 hectares that's what you have to earn all your living from probably not wholly part of that 10 hectares of that 100 hectares, yes, it could quite easily be transferred to that. And there's also a lot of people who it isn't their primary income source. Um, you know, um, particularly somewhere like Devon, where we have patchwork of small farms, there are a lot of sort of 20 hectare farms as well that commercially just aren't viable to be your primary income. Whereas actually, if they're not your primary income, then yes, what we're doing, we still are grazing. So it, it does, it could lend itself to that or a version of it. 